First, I'm going to just take a moment. It's been two and a half years since I've been on the stage. <laughs> so, wow, there's people here. <laughs> right, okay, so we're going to talk about Git. Manuel, I already asked you all whether you use Git. Even if you don't use Git, even if you don't work with code, version management can still be useful. Because what is Git? Basically, it's a library. You have everything of the history of a project there, and it can be used for all sorts of document management. So if you manage the documentation of a project with markdown files, that can also go into Git. If you manage something else, again, with file-based documents, it can go into Git. It's version management with a big undo button, and you can undo and go back to it in the history at any point in time. Yeah? Now, before we really dive in, I just want to make sure that we actually all are on the same page and understand what we're talking about. A lot of people still look at Git or at version management in a kind of old-fashioned way. They look at it as, okay, we have a primary and then we have replicas. And those replicas talk with the primary, get the, 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 yeah, their information from the primary and give back to the primary. That is not Git. That is SVN, that is CVS. That is how we used to do things. Git works differently. You have a primary, but then you have a fork. And then there's another fork. And those forks can all talk together. And each of them contain the complete truth. And each of them can go a different direction, and there's still the complete truth. And each of them can be a remote for your fork. So it's not that there is one source of truth, one primary. There might be one canonical base repository from which everything started. But each of these contain the complete truth. So if there's one thing you take away from this talk, forget everything else I'm going to say. Remember this, there is no one truth. Every repo, every fork, every, even your local copy is the complete truth at that point, at that fork. And you decide which truth you use, which truth you want to believe. So if we're talking uh, the, uh, different forks, different forks can go in different directions. The original might just add a couple of uh, commits and might have one branch which is still work in progress. But a fork might add on to that, and another fork might go in a completely different direction. And all of that is fine. All of that is a complete truth. They are their own truths. So, if you have multiple remotes, you can choose and, it, and pick from each remote which bit you like. Am I losing anyone already? Or are you saying, like, hang on, now suddenly Git is starting to make sense? Good. Now we're getting somewhere. Okay, so when I uh, do a pull, when I grab whatever is in the remote and pull that into my local copy, what am I saying? I'm saying I accept your truth as my truth. When I push up to a repo, whether it's my own fork on a, a, a upstream, as in, you know, online, or when I push up to a repo where I have commit access, I'm saying, my truth is now your truth. This is now the truth of that particular fork. So when I send in a pull request, what am I saying? Please accept my truth. <laughs> Will you accept my truth as your truth? Correct. So when someone merges my pull request? Yes. <laughs> Thank you for asking. I accept your truth as my truth. This is how Git works. And you, can, you don't always send a, a pull request to the primary, to, to the original canonical repo. You might send it to one of the remotes. What, the primary might be abandoned at some point, And one of the remotes 
has an active maintainer and becomes the new canonical primary. So this is how Git works. All of them have the complete truth, and you decide which truth you want to believe. Now, when you send in PRs, if you create your PR based on the, the main branch, which is often called trunk, master, main, sometimes develop, if you uh, create your PR based on that, you can only have one PR open at the same time. If you create separate branches, you can have multiple PRs open. You can have a PR in a separate branch for a documentation change and a PR with a code change in another branch. Why would you do, use different branches for that though? Why not have those two changes in one uh, PR? Can you merge them? Sorry, uh, let me first repeat what you were saying. So they can, you can easily merge them, and you were saying? Smaller PRs are easier to review and merge. Anyone else? Fallback. Fallback? Okay. The, the simple answer is, what are the decision points? Every single decision can yield discussion. If you have a PR which has four decision points, then three of them might be fine and might be approved, but then there's, there's still discussion on that fourth point. And because there's discussion on that fourth point, your PR is not getting merged. And those other three changes, which were perfectly valid in their own right and should have been merged already, are blocked because they're all in the same PR. So if there is a different decision point, use a different PR. And that might mean that some really small changes are in one PR, documentation change. Then you have some CS changes, in another uh, branch, and then you have a feature in another branch and a bug fix in yet another branch. That's fine. Branches are your safe points. You can have as many as you like. How many of you have ever had a repo with more than 100 open branches? Right, you actually understand that they are your safe points. Do manage your branches though, because as soon as something gets merged, throw them away because it's merged into the truth. Don't hold on to everything, because otherwise it gets really messy in your head. How do you find a branch which you're still working on, etc.? So how do you organize branches? You use prefixes. And this is just some ideas of prefixes you can use. You have to find out the prefixes you use yourself, which work for your brain. For my brain, like if there's something I know I need to do but I haven't got time to work on it yet, I might just open a branch without any commits in it yet and just say to do with a little note on what I need to do. It's always a good idea if you create feature branches, if you create a, a feature or a bug fix, to have the issue number of the, uh, the track ticket of the, or the GitHub issue in the branch name, so you can link it back straight away. You know what the reference is, where the original issue was reported. If you're still working on something and it's not ready for commit, you work in progress. <coughs> or there might be something where you have a more complex change, where you need to change something upstream in another repo, which is a dependency for this repo. So you send in a pull request there, uh, but you know that you can only send in the pull request to make the change needed in your repo once that other pull request has been merged. So wait for. I'm waiting for that other PR to be merged. And, you, and often I wouldn't annotate what repo and what PR I'm waiting for. PR. Once something is a PR, you can't make changes anymore as easily as you would if something is only a local branch. So uh, a prefix of PR is an an annotation to give an indication like, hang on, I need to be careful with this branch. I can't make changes without communicating to potential reviewers that I'm still making changes on it. So th there's lots of different ways to do it and you have to figure out your own way. You, I mean, these are just some examples, but figure out your own way. But using prefixes can be a great way to organize your branches and to make it easier to find them back, uh, find the right branch again. Make sense? Is this helpful? Yeah? Okay. 
Now, I'm going to take a drink because my throat is getting dry. But yeah, how to write history and get your PRs accepted. On average, how many of your PRs get accepted? 10%? 20%? 50%? Ninety because they're small. That's a good answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. If you look at history of a of a repo, if you see a history tree like this, what does this tell you? Someone was experimenting, this should never have been committed to the primary uh, branch of that repo. But it is in one of the repos I work on. Not my commit, but still. <laughs> uh, what about this? Can you still follow what was going on in this repo? <laughs> um, what about this? Is this better? And what you see here is that each of the commits also have a prefix sort of indicating what's going on. So it, it identifies what part of the, uh, the code base that commit was working on. Uh, so when you look through the repo, look through the history, it's quite clear to pick out wh what commits are relevant to what you're currently working on. To get a clean history, that requires foresight and discipline. And I'm not talking about deciding everything in advance and, and making those commits from the start straight away clean. Nobody works like that. Our brains don't work like that. Our brains are messy. We start working on a bug fix and then we notice, oh, hang on, that documentation is wrong. So we fix that documentation and then we add a new test and they're like, hang on, but that test should have been... There's five tests for the same thing that should have been in a data provider. So you change that test data to a data provider and then you add your own test. And, and hang on, now I have all those different changes. But I was only working on this one bug fix. So how do you work with that? The discipline you need is to make very small commits and commit often because that will give you a chance to reorganize those commits later into atomic commits, into logical groupings of code which belong together. You don't normally show, share that kind of messy branches with anyone. You have that locally, and that's fine. Nobody needs to see the mess. Believe me, the branches I have locally, you do not want to see. But once you have that mess, and you've got the mess, but clearly annotated, okay, I'm doing something small here, I'm doing the documentation change there, I'm changing something to a data provider there. If you have those uh, small commits, then you can reorganize them, you can pull them out to separate branches, if they should be in a separate branch and a separate PR. You can reorganize the commits, and that, the, the whole fact of creating those small commits and committing often gives you the opportunity to do that. Now, what are the tools of the trade for that? Oh, sorry. I forgot I had a slide about atomic commits here. Okay, atomic commits. Anyone knows what the, those are? Oh. Ooh, I can tell you something new. That's lovely. Atomic commits are basically a unit which is completely self-contained. If you make a bug fix, and that bug fix ought to have a test, then that test is contained within the same commit. Everything that's needed for the commit to be complete is in that one commit. So if you decide, okay, well, I have a PR with three commits, with three different very related changes, and one of those changes is not accepted, you can just pull out that one commit, refer to that one commit, and the other two commits can stay the way they are because each commit is self-contained. It it's passes CI, it uh, has the tests, it has the documentation, it's com complete. Passes CI is important, because every commit should be able to be merged. If it doesn't pass CI, your PR should not be even opened. And when I say passes CI, is anyone here looking at me like, 
what the hell is she talking about? <coughs> okay, CI is continuous integration. Continuous integration is used to do quality checks on your code. So for instance, to run your code sniffer uh, uh, checks, your code style uh, consistency checks, or to uh, run your unit tests, or to run security checks on your code. So those kind of things can be automated and can be automated to run on every PR, on every commit, on every merge. That's continuous integration CI. And I very much recommend you use that. When I do test driven development, yeah? I commit stuff that wouldn't pass CI. Um, in, in long term summit, would that be a problem? Then should I not do that? Or? I'll come back to your question. Because I, I know what you're saying, and I often do the same, but there's a trick to it. Okay, so pass CI. They focus on, those commits focus on one thing. So each commit has one focus. There is no scope creep. And it's so easy to get into the scope creep. But they focus on one thing. And they're easy to review. Sometimes I have a PR with seven or eight commits. And each of them is very interrelated and it all belongs together. But they each make a separate change. It's like storytelling, a little a stepping stone Okay, this step is needed, and then because I made that step, now I can make the next step, and the next step, and the next step. So they are interrelated, they belong together, but they are each separate changes. If you review that as one complete thing, you see one file with only red and, and green, and, and every single line has been changed. If you review each commit individually, it's so much easier then. That, having those atomic commits saying, okay, this test belongs with this change. This test belongs with this change. This test belongs with that change. Then it makes it easy to review. The reviewer knows exactly what you've done, can uh, verify each commit individually, and then say, okay, I now know the whole is complete and is correct and can merge it. Does this make sense? Yeah. I'm going to change a lot of stuff, so can I review the individual commits? Sometimes I feel like it's, yeah, then, then, then you're reviewing stuff that's stale or not really up to date anymore, and that's then changing further commits. Would you then still review all the commits or just all the changes in the... That, the, that, uh, the question is whether you would review as a reviewer individual commits or the complete thing uh, with a complex refactor. Yeah. Well, that really depends. On the one hand, it depends on how well the reviewer knows the code base. Mm -hmm. If they are intimately aware with, with the code base, they understand really well what the refactor is you're going to do, they might just look at the complete thing. Mm -hmm. At the same time, if the, the refactor is extremely complex, that storytelling with those individual commits can make it easier. Like if I move some code from location one to location two, as a reviewer, I would want to know that uh, there were no changes when I moved it. I moved it without changes. That's a separate commit. And then the changes I make are in the, bit, uh, the commit after. That way you can make sure that you know exactly what was changed. And that becomes a lot harder if you look at everything as a whole. And it depends. It really depends on how well you're familiar with the code base and what the changes are. Okay, if, you, if you're interested, I can show you some, uh, some PRs at some point where I explicitly say to the reviewers, review per commit, yeah. because I know that's going to help them, and some others where I don't say that, and it's up to them to decide what they do. So it's also because it helps in the thought process of the developer? Correct. Right. Yes. Right, so what have we learned today? Atomic commits is storytelling. You take the reviewer through your thinking process. They're step by step. They are individual, self-contained changes. And if one of those steps is wrong, you can just pull out that step and all the other steps can still stay in place because you're using atomic commits. Yeah? So, tools of the trade. First off, amend. I've made a commit and uh, I'm going to continue working on something, and, and I run CI, and I'm like, oh, 
I forgot to actually uh, run the coach style checker before I made that previous commit. And there's, there's coach style errors in my previous commit. As that is the last commit I made, I can just amend that commit. I can say, okay, I'm just going to rewrite some code, just add that to that commit. I might even rewrite the commit message and say, okay, fixed, make sure it's past the CI now. So you amending a commit can be either amending it with file changes or amending it with the commit message change, but both can happen, and you can still do that. That's fine. If you've pulled the PR and you've run CI uh, online, and it, all it throws up is a code style error, please amend the commit and do not create a separate commit saying fix CI. That fix CI commit has no value. It doesn't add anything to the history of the project. It's just saying, I forgot something. So amend the original commit and make that an atomic commit again because then it's complete again. Yeah, that's amend. Interactive rebase. How many of you use rebasing? Can I invite everyone who did not put up their hand <laughs> to learn rebasing? Pay very close attention to this part. It's going to make your, uh, your working with Git so much easier and so much more powerful. It's scary. <laughs> Remember that I said that branches were your safe points? Yes? Create a duplicate branch. Just create a branch before you do the interactive uh, commit. Then you have a backup. And you can always go back to your backup. There's nothing wrong with that. And then you do your interactive commit of a rebase. And if that fails and you get into a conflict and you don't know how to get out of it, just reset it and go back to uh, the, the backup copy. Good point. Yeah? <laughs> Safe points. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Right, so what is a rebasing? A plain rebase is, okay, we have a branch which is branched off at some point. The primary branch in the, the repo has moved on. Now I'm ready to pull it, but I want to make sure it doesn't conflict with any changes which have been made in the meantime. So I'm just going to move this commit. I'm just going to cut it off from the, where it was originally attached. And I'm just going to move it to the top of the primary branch again. That's a plain rebase. And you don't need to do this just with one commit. If your branch has five commits, you can just rebase it on top of the, 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 the latest commit of the master branch. And those five commits will be on top of it. That's a normal rebase. Now, interactive rebase is where it gets really interesting. Say we have those commits here, four commits. And one of the commits is because I made some local CI change, uh, uh, CS uh, changes, I'm fixing something up. Another is like, okay, for the storyteller, for the reviewing, it's actually going to make more sense if that commit would be before the other commit. So we can just reorganize them. We can change the order of commits, or we can group commits together and just merge them into one commit. How do you do that? You call uh, interactive rebase, well, you get rebase dash i interactive, and then you get a choice. And you get a choice of what to do. You can choose to reword a commit, then you just get to edit the commit message. You can choose to edit. Then, you, uh, then the rebase stops at that point. You can edit the files, and you can edit the commit message. Basically, you're amending a commit while it's rebasing. You can drop a commit. You can say, OK, that was a something I was trying, but it's not actually relevant anymore. I'm just going to drop that. Not relevant. Or you can fix up, and that's squashing those two commits together. But hang on, there's also squash. I'll get back to that. The difference between squash and uh, fix up in a minute. And you can say pick. Pick means I want that commit. But you can still pick that commit and then move it in a different uh, place in the order of things. So what does that look like? OK, so I'm adding a feature here. I started with a failing test, like you said. Then uh, I'm working on the feature. Then I add some more tests. I add helper methods. Oh, maybe that helper method should have been 
before the feature. Uh, I work some more on the feature, some more on the helper method, etc., etc. You can see what I've been doing here. And this is how a normal human brain works. You, you, it's messy. Now we're going to create order from that mess. So I'm going to do an interactive rebase. I get this screen in which I can edit what I want to do. You can see that by default everything is set at pick. Now I'm going to ch uh, change that. And I'm going to change it like this. So the F means uh, those two, uh, I've moved things around. You can see that the helper is at the top now, the first commit. I've moved all the commits which are related to the helper method next to that, and I'm just going to fix up that commit. Uh, I'm going to pick that failing test. I'm going to squash the, uh, the, the feature into it, and then I'm going to fix up everything else with that. What I end up with, if I uh, then save this and run it, is this, two atomic commits. So yes, very often when I start working on something, to answer your original question early, which you asked earlier, I often create a failing commit first, a failing test. Locally, I will create that failing test because that failing test proves that the bug exists and is very helpful to make sure that the test is actually failing. If I would commit everything in one go straight away, I cannot verify that my test actually tests the bug fix because I can't verify that it's failing because it's together with the fix. So locally, I would have that failing test separate, separately. But then by the time I send it into a PR, I merge them together because they belong together as an atomic commit. At the same time, as a reviewer, if it's a complex uh, bug fix, I may go in, check out that commit, just undo the, the feature change, the, the bug fix, and run that test locally to verify that that test is failing before the bug fix goes in. Does that help? Yeah. Does that answer your original question? Good. Does this, what I just showed you, is this, does this look like magic to you? Does this look helpful? 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 Good. If you want, I can do a live demo uh, in the question bit. But uh, yeah, let's first see if we can get through the slides. Now, the difference between uh, squash and fix up. Squash basically says I want to merge the, ch the file changes, to, so the changes from the, in the files of multiple uh, commits. I want to squash them together. And I want to edit the commi uh, uh, commit message. I can co uh, get the commit messages of all those different commits and I can combine them and I can rewrite them so the commit message encapsulates all the information. Fix up also means I want to combine all the changes, except I want to keep the original commit message of the first commit which I'm using. So if I have a commit where my, all the commit message says is add to that helper, that is not a useful commit message. I, that's just a note to myself that that commit belongs with the helper function. So I don't need to keep that commit message. I can just fix it up. If I have a commit message where I say, oh, hang on, but now I'm, I'm adding some more information because I have had some more insight, and I have actually have a good commit message for that commit, then I want to join those commit messages together. So when you want to join the commit message together, you use squash. If you want to throw away the commit message, except for the first one, you use fix up. And I know you might think like, hang on, but I'm going to make so many mistakes. Again, use those save points. Use temporary branches. Experiment. Go and play with this. When I first started with it, I made so many mistakes. But once I realized how it worked, and actually understood and, and saw the changes were yeah, starting to, uh, to work the way I wanted to, it became my power tool. I live in interactive rebase. How are we doing for time? Uh, 10 minutes left. 10 minutes left? OK. Right. I've already mentioned all this, so let's move on. 
Uh, the next bit, which is actually uh, really uh, interesting, if we're talking about interactive rebase, if we're talking about the uh, squashing and fixing up and editing that commit message, but whether you're amending a commit or whether you're uh, in doing an interactive rebase, we also talk about commit message. So let's, let's pause there a little. What's a good commit message? I already give some hints here, but why are these things important? Someone. For your future self. For your future self. <laughs> Absolutely. What, else? what other reason? When someone else looks at the commit, like, wants to know what happened. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the, okay, you, two years on and you, you want to change it and you're like, what the hell did that person do here? Which may have been me. And you go back and you look at the commit message and now, oh, hang on, now I understand what the reason was behind this change. And maybe I should not change it, but do it in a different way, that, uh, that fix which I want to make. It cannot be too long. And, uh, and this is really important. I see a lot of people who have very short commit messages and then have a really long description in the PR. Please do not ever do that. And there's a very simple reason for it. What if you move from GitHub to Bitbucket? You lose all that information which was in the PR. You do not lose your commit messages. Because that, uh, that remote which used to be GitHub now has a fork and is, lives on Bitbucket, and all the commit messages are, are still there. All the commit information is still there, but your PR information is no longer available. So keep that information in, in commit messages. Make those commit messages useful. So what does it look like? Often I, I often use a, a prefix to just indicate what part of the code base I'm working on. Short description, long description. In that description, Describe why you're making the change, what you're trying to fix, what the alternatives were which you considered and why you decided that this was the right way to fix it. This will help your reviewer, but it will again also help your future self. And also, something which I know few people use, give credit where credit is due. If someone helped you with that commit, if you did, uh, created a commit with pair programming, if someone inspired that commit and you looked at their code for an example on how to do it in your code base, give them credit, co-authored by. And if you look uh, uh, for commits with co-authored by in GitHub, you will see that it actually shows both avatars. Both people get credit for that commit. Credit where credit is due. We are working on open source. Why claim something as your own if it's not? Leave your ego out. Uh, at the door, basically. Okay, now how do we work with this? How do we create those small commits? Because, yeah, again, brains are messy. So we've been working, uh, and, and okay, we've made all those changes, but now how do I, I make those small commits? Because I didn't do that while I was working on things. Well, you can cherry pick. And you can cherry pick individual commits, you can cherry pick files, you can even cherry pick lines. You can uh, cherry pick them, when committing, so you can say, okay, I'm just going to stage a few lines and one file, and the rest of my, uh, my changes, I'm not going to stage yet. I'm just going to commit this first, and then I'm going to stage another part of what I've fixed and make a separate commit again. You can also pick things from other commits or even from other branches. Cherry picking is useful. But once you've changed things, and now you have a PR open, and there's a conflict, what do you do? Do you do a rebase and force push? Or hang on, say CI fails, and how, the PR is open. It's be, you've already basically asked someone, look at my code, review my code. To force push or not to force push, uh, it depends on a, in large part on the conventions in your project. But basically, if it's a non-collaborative branch, you've not pulled it yet, 
force push at will. Feel free to force push, nobody's looked at it, you're fine. If you've pulled the branch, you've rebased it, but not made any changes other than maybe fix a conflict, force push at will. But do leave a comment in the PR, rebased without changes. So the reviewer knows you've not made any changes. Depending on the conventions in your project, if it's been pulled and you fix a typo or, uh, or you know, C, uh, CS fix, maybe. It depends. Sometimes the, the reviewer might prefer to see a separate commit so they know what's been changed, and then they can squash them together on merge. I would recommend squashing them together at merge then. Uh, if, it's a non, uh, if it's a collaborative branch, you're working together and someone else might pull in changes, you might pull in changes, you might push changes, and someone else might push changes, please do not use force push. Because you might override someone else's change and you really don't want to do that. If you've pulled something and the review has already started, do not use force push because you will confuse the reviewer. They will not know what you've changed. They can't see the difference if you've made the change in the original commit. And then they don't know whether you've fixed up what, you, what needed fixing or may, made a completely different change. And they need to do the review completely all over again, which is wasting their time, so let's not do that. Yeah? Okay, I'm very briefly going to go into wh when things go wrong and then skipping a lot of, uh, of the rest because uh, I also have when things go really wrong and when things go really, really wrong. <laughs> if you really want to know, ask me in the questions. I'm just going to do this bit and then uh, we're going to go and ha uh, have some questions. Okay, when things go wrong, reset and refer to the rescue. What is reset? Reset is basically, okay... Uh, I'm just going to go back. I'm just going to remove that one commit. You can do a soft reset. That means I'm going to remove the commit, but I'm going to keep all the file changes, and that allows you to commit them again in a different way. Or you can do a hard reset, and then that commit is gone, and your file changes are gone, and you can start with a clean slate. That's reset. That's something you only do locally. You do not do that on a, a, a public branch. On a public branch, if something has gone wrong, you referred. And what a referred is, is saying, okay, we've had a commit, now I'm gonna basically do the complete opposite of the commit and, and refer to those changes. And that doesn't have to be the top commit at the, at the top of the branch. That can be an earlier commit, uh, as long as there's no conflict. You can still refer to it. But that, if you refer to it, it adds an extra commit which undoes those changes which communicates to other people, again, okay, we've stopped that change, we're not going to do that, and other people can build onto it again. Make sense? Any questions on that? No? Then I'm just going to skip over some slides uh, towards the end. Whoop. Can I... Yep. Yeah. Let's see if I can quickly find that part where I want to go to. Right, this bit. Now, a lot of people are very hardcore and say, oh, you need to learn uh, Git on the command line. You need to really understand all those little commands and, and all those little parameters, and you need to remember it all by heart. No, you do not. You need to know the terminology, and I've used the terminology here, rebase, revert, reset, um, amend, that same terminology is used on the command line as well as in GUIs. But if a GUI works better for your brain, please use one. When I started using, using a GUI, uh, my productivity went up by 300%. I've never looked back. I've never, since that moment, ever, ever, ever used Git on the command line. So use the tooling which works for you. Start experimenting with some GUIs, because especially like how those branches work together, cherry picking from other branches, those things are so much easier when you have a good GUI. Find one which works with your brain, with your visualization, and then get in comfort. Right. 
Questions? Yes. So how you describe them is pretty much the same thing that is called stack branches, which is used by a lot of companies. Because that's a branch on top of a branch on top of a branch, and reviewer are reviewing each branch individually, which is basically how you describe commits should be reviewed when they are atomic. No. Why not? Okay. Stacked branches are often branches which depend on each other. If you would pull those individually, they would conflict. And it, so if you pull them individually and one would get merged and, and the other one is still open, they would uh, create a, a merge conflict. That's why you stack them. Uh, atomic commits, you can have a PR with just one atomic commit. A, a PR doesn't have to have multiple commits. A PR with one atomic commit can be just as valuable or a PR with multiple atomic commits. If you have stacked branches, those stacked branches would still use atomic commits. But the stack has to do with preventing merge conflicts between your open PRs, uh, while atomic commits don't necessarily have to do with that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So basically, it's all about Generally, yeah. Absolutely. With with stacks, you you more than anything you want to prefer uh, prevent merge conflicts. You you know that if the the next change depends on this change and this change needs to be merged, otherwise this change can't be made. That's why you why you use stacking. Okay. More questions, or is everyone just desperate for lunch? That's fine as well. <laughs> Please. Hang on, there's a mic behind you. <laughs> uh, was there a reason GitHub Desktop wasn't included in the software uh, comparison? Uh, not particularly. To me, it's never, I mean, I tried it when it first came out. It was not feature complete and it really didn't work. That, it wasn't that user friendly. So of the, the, the tools I listed, those are the ones which have a better reputation than GitHub uh, uh, Desktop itself. That doesn't mean that GitHub Desktop might have not have evolved to a point that it should have been included. I did not reevaluate it. Okay. How about tower? Tower, I, I think that was on the slide, wasn't it? Oh, sorry. Sorry, yes, could have definitely been on the slide, but I only had eight slots. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, that, yeah, that's a process flow thing. Um, generally speaking, it really depends on how large the team is you, which works together. Uh, if you like, if you work on your own on a repo, yeah, please add your change log entries with your commits. That's fine because that makes again makes them more atomic. Uh, at the same time, if you have a large team working on uh, a project and there's 10 open PRs and each of them adds a changelog entry, believe me, that changelog entry is going to conflict because everyone's going to add their changelog entry at the end of the existing changelog and now we have 10 different changelog entries which are all on the same line. So it, it depends on the project, it depends on how many contributors there are, what the discipline is. 
Sometimes you, uh, one of the tricks I see used is have a template for a pull request where you ask people to add a changelog entry and then the committer which merges the PR adds the changelog entry to the changelog as the next commit or add, uh, squashes it into that commit at the point of merging. Because at that point, you won't create a conflict. But if they are already in the PRs, they will very easily conflict. So the, in big projects I work on, where there's lots of uh, changes in a uh, release, I normally just milestone everything. Uh, there's a, a little tool in GitHub you can enable to force every PR to have a milestone. And you cannot merge without milestone. Uh, and because of that, I can just select the milestone. It will show me the whole list of every single PR which was merged for that milestone and just go through them. Spend ha uh, half a day going through them and just listing the change log then. It depends on the project. I, I can't give you a definitive advice, but yeah, there are some considerations there. Having them always in the commits is asking for merge conflicts. Okay, more questions. So you are very active on GitHub. So the question to you is: Sorry, uh, I am. You are very active on GitHub. Uh, so yeah. A lot of <laughs> so uh, the question to you: Do you merge and commit? Uh, no. Yes. Merge and squash, or just merge? Why, why Again, you? depends on the convention of the projects. In, in a lot of projects, I merge because it also shows the the that there was a PR and, and what was happened. There's also one project where we actually have forbidden to merge, we've forbidden squash, we only allow rebase merge, uh, because that was the convention in the project before I became part of it. And uh, it depends really on what you agree upon with the team of people who have commit rights. Like in WordPress core, basically it's all uh, rebase uh, merges. Uh, but then it's SVN, so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because with Atomic commits, uh, you can just merge because each yeah. of them is separate and easy and understandable and so on. But if it's just a breakdown within the branch while working on a PR... That should not be a PR. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, yeah. that, that should be a work in progress branch. Maybe a work in progress branch you've shared. You might have shared it as a draft PR, but it should not be an open PR if it's a brain dump. Okay. <laughs> More questions? I'm starting to feel, get a feeling that the questions come from the usual suspects. <laughs> Just a small one. You know, what about um, the AdSense uh, entry in WordPress, uh, for example? Um, do we uh, need to, to think, okay, it's the next release? And, uh, will be 6.1, my, my feature will be merged, so I uh, use the, the next version, or do you, should I use the uh, 6.x or something like that to uh, leave it to the committer to use the uh, version which is uh, this patch merged? You're talking about track where the little drop down, which version it should be committed to, or? No, no, the code. Uh, since, um, oh, the sin, oh, the sin stack in the doc blocks. Um, okay, generally new features only go into majors, so then you already have your answer. For anything that is not necessarily a new feature but a bug fix, um, use your own judgment. Look at the track ticket also where it's milestoned in, in track. And the committer might just adjust it depending on what the actual reality is going to be. And, and for, I mean, patches sometimes stay open for years, so there might be patches still out there with a since 4.8 and it hasn't been committed yet. And I do feel sorry when that happens, but it happens. Uh, so don't let yourself be bound too much by that. Just use your discretion and judgment where you think it belongs, submit the patch, and then the committer can make that final adjustment. That's okay. Okay, this was the final question. 
I'll be around. You can ask me questions later. Thank you, Juliette. This was a remarkable talk, considering all the uh, uh, with all the questions that uh, came here. Uh, thank you very much. A warm round of applause. For you.